Hey guys, Johnny May here and welcome to this week's quick tip and for this quick tip we brought one of our Piano with Johnny teachers right here in the studio to share his tools, tips and tricks with you. This is the amazing jazz pianist and educator Austin Bird. So Austin, take it away. My name is Austin Bird. I'm so excited to be teaching today's quick tip. In today's quick tip, we're going to be looking at the great Sonny Rollins tune, St. Thomas, and his amazing solo that he plays from the album Saxophone Colossus. We're gonna be looking at motivic development and how you can take a really simple idea and expand it to create a really melodic, interesting musical solo. We're also going to be looking at some of his great bebop lines and how they're constructed and how you can use those same ideas in your solos. So fasten your seatbelts and let's dig in. All right, everybody, before we start looking at the solo, I want to take a little bit of time and look at the chord changes of this tune because everything that Sonny Rollins plays is based around the harmony of the tune. One of the things I love about this tune is that the harmony is very simple. Most of the chords are very diatonic, which means they all come from the same key. In this case, the key of C major. So let's look at the first eight measures and then we'll take a look at what he does with this solo. So the first chord, C major seven, and then E minor, A seven, D minor seven, G seven, C major 7. And the next four bars is an exact repeat of that. C major 7, E minor 7, A7, seven, D minor 7, G7, seven, C major 7. Great, super simple, super easy. So now let's look at what Sonny Rollins plays. If you look at the notes, you'll see that there's not a whole lot of variety going on, but there's a lot of musical genius happening here. So a motif is a very simple musical idea, it's like a theme. And motivic development is where you take that theme and you expand on it. Kind of like a story. Every story has a theme and then the theme develops as the story goes on. This is a musical story, a version of that. So his motif is just two notes, G and C. That's it. So look at what he does with that simple motif over these first eight bars. He starts by playing the motif, C, G. In the next measure, he changes the C to a C sharp to fit the A7 chord. And then the next measure, G, D, G. So what he's done so far is he's taken this simple idea, he repeats the rhythm, but changes one note, goes to C sharp, then he adds a note. But the overall shape of that idea is the same. He's taking, everything that he's played so far is based off of those first two notes. And then the, the last measure, the fourth measure, he kind of combines all of that in one line. then he ends on a C natural there in measure five. Then he continues, the same kind of idea, the same basic rhythm, he's changing one or two notes. Then he goes, so starting measure five, he goes one, two, three. So right there, he only plays that one G all over the A7 chord. That's really cool because up until now, we've heard the entire motif, the ba da ba da This is the first time where he takes away a note. He only plays one note instead of the two. Measure five, then one note. Then he comes back to the two notes after that. Then going into measure eight over the G7 chord, he kind of combines the G and D and then followed immediately by the G and C. And then going to measure nine, he kind of repeats what he did in measure four again. Now let's play the whole, those first eight measures together so we can hear what it all sounds like in context. So one, two, three, four, one, two. Four, one, two. I love those eight measures. It's such a really brilliantly musical phrase but it's so simple at the same time. And these are things that you can do in your own playing, your own improvising. Take a simple idea like that and see how you can change it, how you can expand on it, add notes, take away notes, change the rhythm, put it in different parts of the measure. Like in the first three measures, Sonny Rollins does all of those things with just this very simple idea. He starts on the end of two, one, two, and three, then he repeats it, one, two, and three, then he starts it on the end of one, a different part of the measure. One, and two, and, and he changes the rhythm a little bit. 
And he does that throughout the entire first eight measures, which is what makes this such an interesting but very simple solo. Now that we've taken a look at the solo and the notes and the rhythms and everything, let's see how it sounds with the backing track. This is going to be at 120 BPM. Isn't that a great eight bars? Now, if you want to download these tracks and practice at home, you can get them from pianowithjohnny.com. Members have access to all kinds of great exclusive content. Now, I'm going to play the chords so and you try the solo. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Let's look at the next eight bars, the second half of the, of the chorus. Now this is where we get, he starts to play a little bit more intricate stuff. This is a great bebop line. So I'm going to play it first so you can hear it, and then I'll explain what's going on. So here it is. One, two, three, four. And the motif again. I like how he bookends the chorus with that little motif. He gets away from it, plays that really great bebop line, then he comes right back to it. So we start, the second half of the chorus starts with E half diminished, then moves to A7, and then D minor 7, and G7, and then C major, C7 with an E in the bass, going to F major, then F sharp diminished, and then G7, and then back to C major. So let's take a look at this line that he's playing here in measures 9 through 12. I'll play it first so you can hear it. So here it goes. One, two, three, four. That's a great line. It's one of my favorite, like, short little bebop lines I just absolutely love because there's so many great things he's doing and it's so musical. So what is he doing? How is, why does it sound like bebop? One of the most important things about playing good bebop lines is outlining the changes using arpeggios, which he's really doing here. On that E half diminished, he starts with 3, 1, 3, G, E, G. Then on the A7, he continues that arpeggio. So what he's doing here is he's throwing in some altered notes to make that sound more like A7. That C sharp is super important because that's the third of the chord. And then he's throwing in the F natural, which is a sharp five, and the B flat, which is the flat nine, because those types of alterations lead really well into minor chords, which, which, which is what he's doing here. The next chord is D minor. So these are all basically thirds that he's playing, just arpeggios. And that G sharp there is just a passing note to get to A, which is the fifth of D minor. Then he continues that, the same arpeggio technique, just five, three, one. That's a great measure there. So what he's doing, five, three, one, and there's another third there. He goes up to G. So this is another example of motivic development, but zoomed in really far. He's got descending thirds here. So he's taking these last two notes, F and D, and he's moving it up the scale to E, G, E. So from F, D to G, E. Then after that, he goes back to playing an arpeggio. Three, five, seven. Then he finishes that arpeggio here on G7. Then he repeats it again. Then some altered notes. With a nice enclosure there going into measure 13. So on that G7, he's continuing that, arpe that arpeggio motif and then altering it again, just like he did over the A7 which sounds great. So over the G7, this is what it sounds like. Those last two notes, that A flat, G flat, is an enclosure, a chromatic enclosure, because he knows he wants to go back to G, C, which is the original motif from the beginning of the solo. So let's look at that. Let's play that whole line all in context. So here it is. One, two, three, four.
I love that line. It's such a great line. And then the last four measures, he just goes back to the original motif. And then he changes the, the second note, then does it again. Then he moves it up to fit the chord of F sharp diminished. And then just plays one note. And then back to the motif there. Let's play those eight measures now with the backing track. Here we go. Three, four. Getting into the second chorus, he does a lot of the same kind of stuff that I did in the first chorus. Starts with the motif, changes it, changes it again, moves it up, and then bebop line. So just, uh, as far as what he's doing with that motif, he's just doing the same kind of stuff, moving it around, changing notes, changing the rhythms a little bit. And then with that bebop line, in the first bebop line, he was using pretty much only arpeggios with a few passing notes. This one's a little bit more involved because he's got a little bit of chromaticism. He's you know, playing some, step, some stepwise stuff, especially over that A7. What he's doing there is he's using D harmonic minor to get into the D minor chord. That's something that you can do, it's a very common thing to do in jazz and in bebop, is when you have a five chord moving to a minor chord, use the harmonic minor scale of that minor chord over the five chord. So in this case, he's using D harmonic minor over that A7. That's where it wants to resolve, but he anticipates that a little bit, or delays it rather, by playing that E natural in front of it. Then more arpeggios. Now let's play the first eight bars of the second chorus with the track so we can hear how it sounds in context. Now moving into the second half of the second chorus, the changes again are the same as the, as the second half of the first chorus. You have that E half diminished going to A7 and then D minor, G7. So let's listen to that line that he plays and talk about it a little bit. So here it is. One, two, three. That's a long line, but there's a lot of great stuff in there. And again, it's a lot of the same stuff that he's already doing in the previous two lines that we've talked about. Lots of arpeggios, a few passing chords, and he's but this time it's a longer line. He's really connecting his ideas more. Starting with arpeggios, a little bit stepwise motion, then a triplet here outlining an arpeggio. Sharp nine, flat nine, then another passing tone. Some more arpeggios, stepwise motion. Arpeggios, passing notes. Let's take this four bars at a time because it's a long line. So the first four bars, like I said, arpeggios, some altered dominant ideas. One thing I want to mention is that 16th note triplet over the D minor 7. That's just an embellishment. He's Instead of just playing an A natural there, I think the line that he was going for was something like this. That's a little bit boring though, like it is. So throwing that little 16th note triplet embellishment in there adds a little bit of interest, rhythmic and melodic interest to what would otherwise be kind of a boring line. That's a great line there. That, so that little 16th note triplet really adds a lot of interest to this line. Now the last four bars, that B flat there, he's playing a little bit early but he's anticipating the next chord, which is that C7. That G sharp there is just a little chromatic passing tone to get, it's an enclosure actually, it's an enclosure getting into that A natural over F major 7. Enclosures are a really important part of playing bebop as well because it adds a little bit of dissonance that resolves very nicely. 
So dissonance, and then it resolves. And here, even though the chord is F sharp diminished seven, he's not playing any notes that fit F sharp diminished. So what he's doing there is he's kind of ignoring that chord to create a, a larger idea that's all just from this key of C major. If you look at the last three measures of the solo, all of those notes are coming from the C major scale. So what, he's making a choice here to ignore that chord to keep a larger melodic idea happening and to keep it flowing. And he wants this to be all C major, all diatonic. So in, so in order to achieve that goal, he has to ignore the F sharp diminished seven, which is okay to do. It's okay to ignore chords sometimes. Not all, you can't just ignore chords all the time. But you can, so if, you're, if your idea is a very strong melodic idea and it doesn't fit the chord, it's okay to go with that and to not play certain chords sometimes. But you have to be very, very careful with that. Because if you ignore chords too often, you're going to play wrong notes and it's not going to sound very good. So you have to be really careful and make sure that what you're playing is very, very, very melodically strong. So let's look at the last three measures here, something he does really cool at the end that I love. He ends that whole line by going back to the original idea. That is super cool. I love the way that sounds. Okay, let's listen to this now with the track. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Now that we've looked at this solo piece by piece, let's play, put the whole thing together and see how it sounds with the track. Here we go. Isn't that such a great solo? There are a lot of things that you can take from this and apply to your, to your own playing. I would really encourage you to, especially to use motivic development, play a really simple idea and see how long you can stick with it. How many different ways can you develop it? Think about, think about it rhythmically, think about it in terms of notes and really try and stretch it as long as you can until you really feel like you've explored all the possibilities that that idea has to offer. John Coltrane, as, you, as I'm sure you know, was an amazing saxophone player, and he said, in his opinion, that Sonny Rollins was the greatest saxophone player that ever lived. That's some pretty high praise coming from somebody like Coltrane. So practice this idea, practice this motivic development, and see how far you can take an idea. You'd be surprised how much material you can get out of a very simple idea. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed the lesson, be sure to check out pianowithjohnny.com. We have over 1,000 step-by-step lessons for all playing levels, where you'll learn your favorite songs, styles, and how to improvise at the piano. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.